Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to um, ask you, those of you that would like to move a little bit further up towards the front, uh, we would like to have more of a, a presence uh, in a more intimate uh, manner, and then the, the latecomers can sit in the back, but those of you that were here beforehand, please uh, come, come closer. Thank you. So I want to first thank you all for coming today. Uh, this, we are very, very delighted to host this lecture as part of our um, ERC funded project called Past and Present Musical Encounters Across the Strait of Gibraltar, which is based at the Faculty of Music here at the University of Cambridge. And it's a project that is a five year project, uh, which is looking at all sorts of aspects of the encounters in colonial and post-colonial uh, musical spaces and encounters uh, in the Maghreb, Spain, and even in France. So what we're looking at in the project is actually how through music, musicians, audiences, governments, and uh, NGOs are also dealing with the issue of diversity and with the issue of integration of diversities and of showing different voices and how then does public policy come from this? How do the minorities themselves use this? How does it show up musically? And are there elements from the colonial past and the patterns that were set during colonialism that are still present today? And what can we learn from that which, which parts do we keep and what can we propose for changes? So um, the principal investigator is Matthew Machen Outenreath, uh, who is, works on flamenco and, uh, and flamenco Andalusi and the, the music of Andalusian fusions with flamenco. We have also a senior research associate that's based in Manchester at the University of Manchester, who's a historian, and he works on Spain and France in colonial and post-colonial times, and in, and in Morocco. We have Steve Wilford, who's a research associate working on Algeria and the Algerian diaspora in France and in London and myself that works on uh, the Jewish voice in Morocco and Spain. And we have a PhD candidate working on jazz and the function of jazz workshops in the integration of minorities. So you see we're really trying to look at it from all sorts of different angles and, uh, and in this work together come up with a, a larger transnational history of this music and this area. So um, in the context of that, the most perfect guest, really, for us is His Excellency, Mr. Andrea Zule, who has worked on music festivals, who has created, it had the vision for, for so many years of using music to this very purpose and, and for this very dialogue. Um, I want to make sure that I give you at least a large and detailed um, element of, of his biography. He was born in Essaouira, Morocco, and educated in Paris, where he studied economics, journalism, and international relations. And before he was uh, the counselor to his majesty, the king of Morocco, he was the counselor to the previous king, uh, Hassan II, and now he's the counselor to the current king, his majesty, Mohammed VI. He was actually uh, a executive vi vice president of Paribas Bank in Paris um, until 1990, so from 1968, so along. He will talk, I think, some about this this experience of being also a Moroccan in Paris at that time and how he was already working on, on cultural aspects. Um, so he has actually worked on the economics of the development of Morocco and on the political aspect, 
But one of the interesting things is that he's worked on many initiatives that, that have to do with the perspective of deepening the reconciliation between Jews and Muslims. And he has talked with Jewish and Muslim communities throughout the United States, Europe, Morocco, the Arab world, and Jewish diasporas. He's actually the founder of a group called the Aladdin Group that is uh, for teaching about the Holocaust education in the Arab world, and they have a series of publications. He's the president of the Foundation of Three Cultures and Three Religions, which is based in Seville. And also, he is a, a member of a group of the United Nations, uh, which is called the High Level Group for the Alliance of Civilization. And in this context, he was elected the president of the Euro, Euro Mediterranean Anna Lind Foundation. So, as you see, he has this very large international base of work on this. And then in his native Isawida, he started 14 music festivals of all sorts of different kinds of music, which he will discuss, which has to do with the, with the redevelopment of the city, and but really an influx of, of people from all of the regions of Morocco, internationally, and as well, a space for a different kind of dialogue that is really I've experienced it. I've been going there since 2007. And it's, there's a, a special magic to what happens in these festivals in Esawira that he will speak about. So just recently, less than a month ago, His Majesty Mohammed VI came to do the inauguration of a historic center that Mr. Azoulay spearheaded the remodeling of called Bit Dakira, the House of Memory, which was a uh, synagogue in Esawira. And together with it, there is a, a museum space and a space for research, a, a new research center that's been uh, inaugurated. So we want to show you, just to start, before he begins his, his speech, five minutes of this video, which will show you the relationship that Morocco has to its Jewish history currently, and the relationship of the book, the rabbis, and, and the music. تعتبر نموذجا متفردا في صبو القيم الانفتاح والتعايش بين المسلمين واليهود والمسيحيين مما أطفى على المدينة سبقة الكونية وببدخل بيت الذاكرة تقدم للسلام على أمير المؤمنين السيد أندري أزولين صشر جلالة الملك الرئيس المؤسس لجمعية الصويرة موغادور وأعضاء اللجنة العلمية لبيت الذاكرة وأعضاء مكتب جمعية الصويرة موغادور والمهندسين المكلفين بعمليات ترميم هذا المشروع والحاخام الأكبر للمغرب السيد جوزيف إسرائيل والحاخام السيد داغيد بيتو وبفضل ما اتسمت به من قيم الانفتاح والتسامح والسلام التي تشكل الأساس الذي ترتكز عليها المدينة العريقة أصبحت الصويرة قلعة محصنة لتقدم عبر قرون من التاريخ المثال على مغرب السلم والتسامح والحرية وإشاعة القيم الإنسانية وتعكس زيارة صاحب الجلالة في بيت الذاكرة بمدينة الصويرة العناية الخاصة التي يوليها أمير المؤمنين للموروث الثقافي للطائفة اليهودية المغربية وتقع هذه المعلمة الرائعة بدرب العش وتجسد هندسة المكان وزخرفته وبساطته معطيات حول الطرات الصويري اليهودي الخالص والضرب في تاريخ الشعوب والأمم وبهذه المناسبة أدى الفنان ميشيل أبيتا أغاني دينية كما ألقى الحاخام الأكبر للمغرب السيد جوزيف إسرائيل كلمات المباركة التقليدية التي تتلوها الطائفة اليهودية للتضرع لله عز وجل 
So with no further ado, I'm very happy to introduce Mr. Andrea Azoulay here to Cambridge. Thank you for coming. I have seen this video, I don't know, many times, but it's every time so moving and so exceptional. And just keep in mind the fact that what you have seen for a few minutes was in Islam, in a Muslim country with my fellow Muslim compatriots. It was in the Arab world. And it was just less than three weeks ago. Just for you to keep in mind the fact that this kind of very special chemistry, spirit, school, Moroccan school, is something which, unfortunately, is not what you are looking on or watching or reading in your newspaper and watching on your TV, listening in your radio in the daily life. But it do exist. It exists and it's not cosmetic. It's not a posture. It's 
something which reflects I don't know how many hundred years of history. As I said yesterday in London, I'm usually, I mean, I think it was you, Vanessa, who tells that I'm usually introducing myself by saying I'm just 3,000 years old as a Jewish person, Moroccan Jewish person, just to try to remind my friends and the audiences where I'm usually addressing that Judaism in Morocco was close to 1,000 years, arrived 1,000 years before Islam. So for those who are not, uh, I mean, convinced or who are just skeptical or saying, how could you, uh, as a Jewish person, being the advisor of the commander of the Islamic faith? I have no problem. I feel totally relaxed. I am at home for such a long time with Islam, more recently, with, but with all the... my... Uh, France, my Moroccan friends, I belong to this very rich and uh, very deeply rooted diversity of my country. I can tell being Jewish that I'm also an Arab, I'm a Berber, and in this hour I can say also maybe I'm a Phoenician or a Roman because there were so many civilizations who uh, uh, have been for centuries in my hometown. So first of all, I, I want to tell my very, very deep gratitude to you, Vanessa, to you, Ruth, to you, to all the organizers who are giving me the chance this evening to share with you what I feel, what I have tried to partly achieve, and what was my life challenge for giving a chance, the best chance possible to my country and for giving also as a return to my hometown of Sawira a chance for a, a better life. And then I will start with that. I'm not a professional, I'm not an academic, I'm not a professor. I'm in Cambridge, you know, it's uh, not easy. But uh, I want just to be in a very didactic, pedagogic uh, approach to share with you this long uh, travel uh, all along my life. And I will start with one of the challenges I'm trying to be confronted, I'm confronted to it, but I'm trying to achieve which is to build or to rebuild something different between Islam and Judaism, to refound trust, and to try to keep alive what was for centuries achieved in Nesawira, Mogador. I'm saying Mogador, my hometown, because Nesawira, I was telling that to, to, to France, uh, usually in Islam, you have Muslim majorities in the cities. I mean, there is no place where in the Muslim world you have non-Muslim majority. And Mugador and Sawira <coughs> was the only except, exception from Morocco to Indonesia in the 19th century and the early 20th century Mogador, who was at this time, 19th century, the capital of the country, for at least 35 or 40 years, Esawira was with the Jewish majority. And I feel personally responsible just to 
tell this story because it expressed and it shows the art of possible. There were around 30, 40 synagogues in this city at that time. Amazing. And we were at that time also very focused on the UK. And there are so many <laughs> nice uh, episodes at that time. Uh, I'm usually always referring to the Belisha beacons we have in the street all over the UK. But nobody knows that Belisha is the name of a Jewish family of Esauer. And he was War and Defense Secretary in 1939 and 1940, in a very crucial, vital period in this part of the world. And there were so many Moroccan Jewish families from Esauera who have been in the UK, especially in Manchester and London at that time. And we have a real history book between our two countries and between Esauera and the UK. And that's why I feel a little at home here, but just for you to know that by now, Esawira, which was, as I said, in the 19th century, for a very long time, the capital of the country, was uh, experienced a very depressive period during the French mandate, the colonization, and also after we ended the colonization of, the, of France. But now, it's a very flourishing city, and it's a city which is, I can see, a flagship city for two things, for two main uh, dossiers. The first one, creating a new paradigm between Islam and Judaism. And it's not just a rhetoric or a theory, it's in our daily life. And it's not only in my mind as a Jew, Moroccan Jewish person, but in the mind, in the large majority of my, uh, the other inhabitants of Sawira, Muslims largely, and it's, it's also a place, a city where Judaism is coming back. There is a very small Jewish community in Morocco, declining usually in many places, but Esauera is the only place where it's growing. And it's not by accident. It's because we gave a chance to the people to know more, to be teach to be part of this retaking over of the whole book of their history. You cannot change history. One day or another, it will tell you or remind you the truth. And the second goal I want to discuss with you is the central key role of music and culture who have been prior for the renaissance of the, of the, of the city. So I start by Judaism and Islam. First of all, we have made Esauira as an open city to all. We do accept and agree the diversity of our opinion, the viewpoints of all, we are not just saying everything is okay for all, 
No, we have challenges and to face those challenges we will just tell the reality. We will not avoid any problem. We are just, I mean, as I said before, retaking over of our own history and memory, but as the Jews or our, uh, as the Muslims, we Moroccan are part of the challenges who are unfortunately still so tragic in the Middle East. So we are just open to all viewpoints. And we started 30 years ago. And it created a different, let's say, way of being together, even if we disagree. But in fact, and it is the, this Esawira spirit, or the Esawira school, there are less and less people who disagree. It happens that we, because as I said be, before, we are so deeply rooted in this land, the land of Morocco, and uh, in Islam, in the Arab culture, Arab solidarities, Arab way of life, that uh, naturally we were fighting for a solution, not for war, not for confrontation. Nobody asked us to be an activist for peace, but we were activists for, uh, for peace, obviously, because we want to be loyal and to be part of the way, it's my experience, the way I was educated by my rabbis, we have seen some, the way I was educated in my Jewish school in the Sawira, maybe, I mean, I have been nursed and forced by all those values of dignity, justice, freedom. And uh, the way I was educated was, I mean, you cannot be free, you cannot be, you cannot be eligible to dignity or freedom if the one who is in front of you is not eligible to the same quality of life. Same dignity, same justice, same freedom. And it happens, and it's obvious, that by our time, by my time, the one I have in front of me is Palestinian. So, I want to remain free myself, to remain free myself, to enjoy dignity, to enjoy justice, and to keep it alive, I have to help the one in front of me also to enjoy the same justice, the same dignity, the same freedom. And it's uh, something that we discuss, I mean, very quietly, relaxed, and educating our children in the same way, with the same vision. But, I mean, the method and the gateway to that was not politics, unfortunately. We failed to use politics to just be coherent with ourselves. So, in 1991, I decided to try to experience a different approach by inviting culture, legacy, heritage, literature, cinema, music, in place of debating politics. Not only to build this kind of uh, relation with my fellow Muslim compatriots, but to give a second chance to my, to my city to rebound economically, humanly, but to make it short because we don't have enough time to discuss the details. But when I started in 1991, there were seven hotels in the Sawira. Now we have 527 hotels. And the city changed radically, thanks to music first. As Vanessa said, we have now more than 10 festivals a year. We started, but there is no free lunch. I mean, when we invite music, when we have a new festival, it's always with 
something which is more than emotion or than enjoying music. And we started with the Gnawa Festival, Gnawa World Music Festival. We, have now, we are now at the 23rd edition. The Gnawa has, are this part of Morocco who are the Afro-Moroccans. They are usually black. black. Uh, they were, until the festival was created in Asawira, they were, I mean, stigmatized, ostracized, they were in the margin of the Moroccan society for many reasons. And we decided to, to create a festival for them, guided and inspired by the jazzmen, the most famous jazzmen who visited the Sahara a long time ago. And the first records between the stars of jazz and the Gnawa Malmin was in the 70s. And I, I met some of them at that time, and they explained to me how this Hajhuj, the Gambri, the Gnawa guitar, if I may say bass, was really in the heart and of the blues. And so I kept it in mind. And uh, with my very good friends, Jasmine or jazz woman, we decided to have a festival. And people were very, I mean, especially in Morocco, were very skeptical, doubt. <laughs> well, having a big festival with the most marginal part of the Moroccan musical legacy or society, marginal in the Moroccan society, will not make it, will not do it, will not succeed. First edition, 40,000 people. Second one, 150,000. And we reached till 700,000 people attending this festival in a city of less than 100,000 people, could we imagine? And I remember the title, the front page of the New York Times, the Sauerado Woodstock of the Modern Time. It was magic. It was so powerful that, I think that I said that yesterday, traveling from my professional agenda all over the world, people are very surprised, seeing I'm from Mesawara, but I'm not black, I'm not a Gnawa. So it was so powerful. So just to balance, I decided to create a chamber music and opera festival. Same doubt, saying uh, Mendelssohn, Brahms, Mahler, well, cannot work in the south of Morocco. It will be a big failure. That, that I mean, mm -hmm. it became now we are at the 17, no, at the 20th edition, and it is one of the very famous, uh, very more uh, highly respected festival south of the Mediterranean. And then I created a third one. I will not review the 14 festivals, but just a few words about one of the festivals which is very dear to my heart, and which is the only one of that kind in the world, Festival of the Des Andalusie Atlantique. As it's, it's obvious that, I mean, Andalusia or Andalusia is on the Mediterranean thing, but Esawira, it's a semi-island on the Atlantic. What do you have to... Why are you referring to Andalusia? But Andalusia is not the soil you have and you are working on. It's your mindset, what you have in mind. And it is a festival where I decided to have on the stages only Muslim and Jewish musicians, singers, dancers. And it's fascinating. So powerful, so beautiful every year. Thousands of people attending. Just to tell you that thanks to music, there is a rendezvous on this earth every year where Jews and Muslims are coming by thousands from all over the world, enjoying just to be together first, 
performing music together, singing together. That is a music miracle. But it do exist. And I can tell you that really people who are coming, attending this festival, when they, the festival is finished, they leave the Sawira, but they are not the same. And every year, more and more people coming. And uh, it is easy to understand. And we are not just creating something new. We are just continuing this, what we have experienced in our childhood, our parents the same, our grandparents the same. We have this kind of, I, we name it matruz, which means brodery. And we have songs, uh, music, songs, can I say, with text, uh, I mean, alternating with part of it in Hebrew, part of it in Arabic, in the same song. And uh, it reminds us that many Jewish singers were educated by the muezzin, and many Muslim singers were educated in terms of music by rabbis at the synagogue. One of the most famous singers we have by today for the Andalus classical music, Allah, in Morocco, his name is from Esawera, his name is Abderrahim Suri. His father was a musician, he was educated by a rabbi. And himself was also teached by a Moroccan Jewish person in Esawera. So, for me, it's a very, very rewarding, exciting experience. Unfortunately, there was no title for this festival in the New York Times. But we have tried to make it true. And not for one shot, on the long run, to make it durable. But, I mean, I see it every year really like a miracle. I said that uh, how to give a chance to the country all around to know that it exists. I failed on that point because, I mean, if could I imagine every, every year that if it was the country, having this kind of experience, but having Jews and Muslims, I mean, fighting, will be on the front page. But when they are in the same place for a week, by thousands, enjoying just being together, there is no place in the front page for that. So that's why I mean, when I have the occasion, the opportunity, the chance to explain that it exists, I never miss this chance, this opportunity. And that's why I'm sorry to be a little longer on that point, because just for you to know that it is possible. And it is the art of possible. And it created a different paradigm in the country, but also far away. We have every year hundreds of Palestinians and Israelis coming to attend. And I remember that in one of our editions, a, 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 a young Israeli singers from Moroccan origin, Netal Kayam, they push, I mean, she pushed the creativity or the, I don't know how to qualify it, to invite with her, it was not on the program, a Palestinian singer. And they performed together 
the song named El Qudsi. I think it's Ferus who was singing in it, and then it was first time that it was experienced. El Qudsi, it's a song, an Arabic song, a Palestinian song, addressing the issue of Jerusalem. And this young Israeli singer, Netal Kayim, Nel Kayim, she decided, even if it was like a taboo, to perform it with a Palestinian on the stage, in a sour. Not because she agrees on all what this song is saying, but just to send this signal that why not to discuss it? Why not for me, as an Israeli, to listen to you and to sing with you? We'll discuss it later. And it was fascinating, fascinating. And the audience reacted very positively. I was amazed that we, by thanks to music, we could just go as deeper and as risky, I mean, position or approach. And people were just normal even if they were not happy, maybe, I don't know, but they agree just to have it together and to see after what it's possible to do together. So, still a long way, but, I mean, 30 years after, 29 years after I started, I can tell you that By the time, by this very difficult, very regressive time, we are confronted to, all of us, time of denial, time, time of break of culture, religion, civilization, very, very, very archaic period. There is a place, there is a country, where we are making stronger, deeper, durable, exactly the contrary. And when, in this video, when, when I started in my speech that Morocco is, uh, I don't know, how do you do name Boussole in Anglais? Compass. Compass? Morocco and the Sawira are the compass we need by our time. Just to, to tell us a chance to find a way. I'm not, uh, and I will conclude on this point, I'm not telling you that it's easy every day. I'm not also uh, trying to tell you that history between Islam and Judaism for such a long period, centuries, were always a happy story. There were problems, certain times, certain period, but at the end, the balance is so <laughs> positive. I mean, I will never forget also to mentioned that during the Holocaust, and Vanessa was referring to what I'm trying to do, it was not just to teach Holocaust to my fellow Muslim compatriot, it's to send a wake-up call to the Western world, and especially to the Jewish world, in Israel and in the diaspora, to remind them that when the Holocaust was in Europe, was in the Western world, the very rare, very few signal of the world community towards the Jews who were at the concentration camps, those signals came from Islam, came from the Arab world, and especially from my country. The King Mohammed, the late King Mohammed V was the one who 
deny to the French occupiers to, at that time it was the Vichy government and the French representative came to him in the palace, palace saying we need the list of the Jews in your country to prepare the yellow stars for them. He said I have no Jews, I have just Moroccan citizens which, which happens to are being Muslim and Jews. But if you want to put star, uh, yellow stars on their breast start with the royal family. And they never came back to him. And he protect the Moroccan Jews even during the French mandate and the law of the Vichy government. And so many European Jews who were fleeing from Germany and other countries were received in Morocco and they survive thanks to Morocco. So we want also the Western world, world to know that because this kind of story, the Mohammed V and the hundreds of families, Jewish families who were saved, were saved by Morocco. I mean, it's not in the history book in the European universities or in the Jewish universities even in the Moroccan universities. And we have created this group effectively to resist the denial of Holocaust in, the, in Islam because there was some temptation uh, to do it. And also to let the Western world know that Islam and the Arab countries, Arab individuals, Arab leaders, they were, I mean, doing, they have done their best not only to protect and to save or to harbor Jews who were fleeing from Europe, but also in the case of Morocco, they didn't agree to implement the law of the occupiers for discriminating or killing the Jews. So, as I said, it's a long way. Now we have to continue, not to give up, because, I mean, it's still very difficult because of the situation in the Middle East. But this kind of little light, this out of possible, this wake-up call from Morocco and the Essaouira is something that at least we have to know. And why not to spread this message through music, through literature, through cinema, uh, paintings, to keep it not only alive, but, but to make it larger, deeper, and stronger. Thank you.